So, this story all starts when I caught this fish with my dip net the other day. I caught this fish and I noticed, hey, it has barbels on its mouth, little whiskers, and it has a beautiful, colorful green spotted pattern up along its top flanks. Not just that, it has these beautiful little mirror-like scales on its tail, along its spine, and up towards its head where they look like actual chrome or mirrors. So this is a fish I had never encountered. And I thought, well, that's a weird looking carp. So I went home and I decided to take a look at what specific carp species this could be. And it turned out that there was an incredible story behind this specific fish in America. Not just in America, but in Europe and in the rest of the world. This little fish could give goldfish a run for their money for popularity. This fish was once only for royalty to eat. And check out how those scales sparkle. So now, strap yourselves in. I am about to tell you what three days of research has taught me about this incredible fish in the first part of two, where I am going to tell you about the story of mirrored carp or the European goldfish. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with the secret history of living in your aquarium. Now, when I caught this fish, I was surprised. I was like, wow, what a beautiful species. And in this nasty bog, I'll show you a clip of that in one second. But this turns out to be Ciprinus Carpio, which sounds like a made up Latin name, I know, but Carpio is the species name of the European carp. And this is a subspecies of Ciprinus Carpio, which would be the wild European carp. It turns out that for over 3,000 years, humans have been domesticating this fish. They've been keeping it, eating it, and refining it for different things. Now, all the way back in Roman times, I found references in the past to them keeping carp and uh, Wells catfish and uh, eels that were freshwater eels and all sorts of things like that in Roman times and in Greek times. And they kept them and basically if they found an albino one or a platinum or, you know, sparkly one, they would keep it and it would be special and they would try to breed it out for the emperor or for the royalty in society. Well, it turns out that this fish was exactly the same kind of story except its genetics have been modified for so long that it has stuck with us and this fish was found originally in germany and kind of uh, over to ukraine so kind of eastern europe and the balkans and they think that in austria possibly coming up the Danube River into Germany and Austria as a main uh, speciation point for its natural range, that is where this fish was first domesticated officially. Now I say officially because the Romans don't really give us insight into them selectively breeding, but this is the first selectively bred fish in Europe that we have written proof that yes, they were selectively breeding it and they know they were trying to sculpt it, try to make it look beautiful. They wanted it to be scaleless so it wasn't hard to eat. And they wanted it to be beautiful so that there could be nice presentations when they cooked the fish. And when catching them, they didn't look like a gross uh, fish. And oftentimes scaled fish were seen as a lot more lower class because it was a lot more work to descale the fish before serving them to uh, whoever was going to eat them for dinner. So, the Austrians, starting in 1227, write about this going on. There's monks in Austria that write about domesticating this fish, keeping it on the monastery grounds, and trying to selectively breed them. And by 1227, it's very clear that they already have this fish in the form that we see it today. So, really interesting uh, that they already had it before that, but we just don't have a written record. It could be that it was held over from the Romans, and it may be older than the goldfish for all we know. However, we don't have any proof of that, so I'm not going to say that today. But this fish came to America, both in its wild form and its domestic form, and was the talk of the town. Every single state wanted it, rich people wanted it, 
it was a highly desirable fish. And I want to tell you that story now with a little bit of help that I found from the American Carp Society online, which I didn't know was a thing until two days ago. And also with a book called Fishing for Buffalo, which is about early fishing in America. And so I want to tell you the rise to prominence in America of this beautiful fish and we'll look at it some more we'll talk about its life and uh, how to care for it and all that first then we'll talk about the American part and then in part two we're gonna talk about how these fish became looked down upon as oh that's just carp that's a bottom feeder gross I don't want to eat that I don't want to fish for that they're invasive they're a problem so how did things change that's what we're gonna talk about today so strap in get ready and here is the story this is the culmination, the biggest pond point where they're restoring it. There's nice willow trees and a park here. This used to be a bog and full of cranberries and all sorts of foods that the Native Americans held sacred. And they're trying to restore it. If you've seen my bog restoration video, that's where we're at. But look in the shallows how active the water is with fish. So we're gonna go in there full blazing with uh, with the net out and try to catch stuff. But finally, we 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 will most definitely see lots of different species of fish here. Uh, but these are mostly warm water species. That's gonna be the difference. Not as many sticklebacks and uh, probably not as many trout and things like that are here. More bass, sunfish, uh, maybe some some uh, suckerfish or you know minnow type top minnows. All right, everybody, so this part of the story is going to be all audio. So if you guys want to listen via podcast style and just listen to it uh, on your headphones, that's totally fine. I will be filming this beautiful specimen in this little one-gallon specimen container, uh, and then he'll be going back into a 50-gallon tote that is serving as a uh, tub or a pond this year. And then hopefully he'll be going into a large pond uh, that I'll be building on my property soon. So uh, for now, he's a little baby that's only about three and a half inches long, but soon he will grow to a very large size. So let me tell you all about their history, their the care that they need, and then the story of how they got here to America. All right, so Saprinus carpio, this unassuming yet beautiful little fish that I caught the other day, has quite the story to tell us. So the first official records, as I said earlier, uh, of this carp existing, the mirrored carp, this domestic strain, is in 1227. And these records come from Austria, and the Austrian nobility was urging for the stocking of these carp into estate ponds, castle moats, and for consumption of the royal court and family, as well as the higher-ups in the church clergy. They were considered a delicacy, but only one that the rich and powerful could enjoy, including laws against the peasantry in a feudal society even eating these special carp. So over time, the farming of these carp spread throughout the European continent, with more and more ponds and other bodies of water being stocked to raise this fish. This also coincided with the clergy stocking them as well, with monks stocking carp in their monastery ponds for raising. And due to the carp's large and numerous scales, cleaning the fish prior to consumption was really time-staking and uh, painstaking and time consuming as I mentioned so the monks started pulling off scales and they realized that this wasn't a, this wasn't any faster they pulled the scales off young fish so soon they they realized they needed to start kind of uh, selecting for the carp with less scales and that is exactly what they did over time and by 1227 they had started calling this the mirror or the mercury or the royal carp uh, there's all sorts of names from each country and territory that this fish enjoyed. Uh, but, needless to say, by 1496, it was known throughout the continent, and the King of England wanted some of these. So in 1496, the King of England got some of these. Uh, he became uh, the first man in the UK, current day UK, to have these, and then quickly spread them as gifts through the nobility and wealthy uh, all throughout Great Britain. Now, soon after this, 
Some of these fish began to get out when their ponds would flood or when a, a rich person's estate would flood. And soon, these fish began crossing back with the normal European carps, which had been a food source for thousands of years for Europeans. Uh, but they also stayed isolated in some cases. And so different morphs and variations began to form uh, by 1500. And word of these changes began to travel around Europe at the same time. So early on, uh, these fish were seen as just a royal thing. But as those fish escaped and became diluted uh, in the gene pool back with normal carp, they were a little less uh, royalty specific. And more and more people started to be able to eat them. By the time the Industrial Revolution comes around, everybody is able to eat them if they can afford them. And they do catch a, a higher price for being scaleless because it's a lot less work, especially when you've got like a 30 pound fish uh, when you don't have to scale it and when you can eat the skin as well it makes for a much uh, a much more valuable food resource so these fish are fast growers and they're easy to spawn and they can live in warm or cold conditions so this is why they spread across Europe uh, they became a food source because they can survive in just about any type of water conditions that are found naturally and even a lot that are found unnaturally such as the sewage and wastewater that was common all throughout the era um, back then around the Renaissance era so when Europeans began moving to America as early as the 1790s people started wanting both the goldfish, which was a new uh, a new fad that had swept Europe in the 1600s, and this carp equally. They wanted both of them. They wanted this mirrored carp, and they would pay almost anything to get it across the ocean. So, in the 1800s, it's not exactly clear when, but certain rich individuals began importing these fish. And at first, many died on the voyage across the ocean. But by the mid-1800s, steamships came about, and more and more of these fish began surviving. And rather than just a few uh, aristocrats on the East Coast in their private ponds as kind of a food delicacy, these started to be kept by aquarium keepers, people who kept uh, ponds and fountains uh, and uh, and gardens for the public and things like that, and they became very desired. Around the same time, overfishing of all of America's waters on the East Coast was happening, and as Americans were heralding the fact that they could build canals and they could dredge rivers and they could put ships and you know millions of millions upon millions of trees and timber floating down rivers that they could alter the landscape and that they could put train tracks across the land they also decimated all of the water and and land that they came in contact with uh, while doing these things and so soon as this period starts in American history the steam age really uh, you start seeing a lot of large bodies of water that are slow moving and because of that they get lots of sunlight which means they grow lots of vegetation which means they also grow you know algae the nitrates go higher and then they've been so heavily fished for food by native North American settlers uh, or Americans specifically at the time that all of a sudden they had total collapse that was being written about by the government. Also you start getting debris flowing into the rivers and a lack of oxygen because of the silt that would fall into the rivers and the seasonal flooding with no trees holding back the soil and this caused the oxygen to dip and the clarity to fall in bodies of water and so aquarists and government agents and uh, biologists all together began thinking well what can we do to feed America fish were one of the primary protein sources back then especially before you could get trains running to every corner of the country or cars or jets or anything like that so they had the idea of let's bring in carp uh, 
They're known to survive in even the worst conditions in Europe. They can live in castle moats. They can live in human sewage, as I've said three times now. They can live anywhere from 0 degrees Celsius to 35. So that is 32 degrees all the way up to, say, 100 degrees or so. No problem. They can even live in brackish water. So these fish, full grown, can have up to... 300,000 eggs in a single spawning session by a female. Now that's not typical. Usually they have somewhere between 50 and 100,000 eggs with a full-grown female. And uh, they will typically spawn in the spring when the water temperature is warmer. They can also spawn though multiple times. So if the water doesn't get too hot or too cold, if it stays uh, that kind of springtime temperature for some reason or another, they can spawn up to three times in a year with reports of up to a million eggs from one female uh, existing in scientific literature of this specific species. So in the larger bodies of water with plenty of preferred habitat uh, and food to forage for, the mirrored carp can grow to huge sizes and they match that of the common carp with a maximum weight of 88 pounds or so and uh, a match maximum length of 45 inches or about a meter uh, and a half so the mirror carp can also live a long time they uh, have been reported at up to 38 years old in captivity uh, but 20 years is more likely in the wild for these large uh, fish. So though a mature female can lay up to a million eggs in a single year, the population numbers for a body of water tend to remain fairly stable once it has been populated uh, by an initial crowd of fish. This means that the nearly as many eggs do not even survive uh, before rotting or dying uh, due to lack of oxygen, getting buried, getting eaten by predators, getting eaten by their parents, or environmental factors, you know, fungi, bacteria, and all the rest. But carp eggs that, successful, that do successfully hatch are then susceptible to predation from pike, perch, trout, salmon, birds, you know, great blue herons, raccoons, uh, you name it, turtles. So they didn't explode right away when they were put into American waterways, but they did become pretty common. And here's where we're really going to get specific for American viewers if you're curious about uh, how they got here. Uh, so from the book Fishing for Buffalo by Rob Buffler and Tom uh, Dixon, uh, they have some really interesting information and uh, they go on to say that there are carp records being transferred during the Greek and Italian uh, Roman Empire periods several millennia before the writings of the European monk that talk about this intriguing mirror carp of the Middle Ages. These carp were, were reared in ponds and castles as well as in monastery gardens. As a standard of living, the average European and Englishman improved, and so did the availability of this special domestic bread, uh, breed of carp. So they became the food for the bourgeoisie, and those leaving for the New World also wanted to bring their special delicacy. These fish also became tied to weddings, and by the mid-1800s, Americans were asking for carp at restaurants and at fish markets, and were shocked to find that nothing like that existed here other than catfish. Particularly the Jewish diaspora in, in uh, New Amsterdam and in the Northeast, as well as in the Deep South, uh, they would prepare carp for Gentile fish and were aghast uh, that they couldn't get it uh, on, on certain days that were for uh, prayer and religious uh, celebrations. Also, the Scandinavians, the Belgians, the Austrians, French, and Germans all specifically served carp at weddings, Christmas, and New Year's. And so they had assumed that the land of milk and honey would have carp as well. So in sense, they wrote the American government. They demanded that carp be made available. And even though individuals had brought carp over, in 
1876, Dr. Spencer F. Baird of the Smithsonian Institute became the head of a newly appointed United States Commission of Fish and Fisheries, and he began receiving these thousands of requests for these special carp by American citizens. By 1880, he was getting over 2,000 handwritten letters a year from different individuals, some writing monthly. These requests were timely because the fishing commissioner, uh, Dr. Bard, was also looking for fish to import into the new country. So during the mid-1800s, the native fish were being netted by millions and millions of pounds a year, specifically from Illinois and Ohio, uh, where the Mississippi River and the Ohio River were. Uh, also, new territories like the Oregon Territory, California, and Texas were just being settled, and people were moving out there without food being readily available. There was wild game, but it was known that as soon as humans move in in dense numbers, that wouldn't cut it. So northern and western and southern expansion depended on the fact that they have a food source of protein when they went with them that they could bring with them and that would breed with them other than just chickens and pigs which don't grow fast enough or in numbers high enough so as i mentioned the the environment was also being depleted heavily of the things that native fish need so all that people were finding were suckers and walleye on the east coast by this time. The trout and bass and all the tasty fish that they had grown accustomed to, eels and things, were no longer found easily. You had to go way outside of town to find them and they weren't being found in the numbers uh, that could feed people in the city. So these fish were then brought in as more fish like the northern pike, the buffalo fish, and other fish were displaced, you know, American engineers thought, well, we'll put them in the Erie Canal, we'll put them in river channels, we'll put them in levees and dams and lakes that were building all over the country. But it turned out that the conditions with the silt and uh, a lack of light and oxygen and everything, that they would get these big algae blooms and die-offs and there just wasn't anywhere that fish seemed to be prospering where human productivity was going on. That was until the glory of the carp. So carp and catfish share that in common. Now catfish were seen as kind of a poor man's food for a long time. They were seen as slave food and kind of as food for uh, poor immigrants. But all along uh, the Mississippi, people began to realize that they needed to do something. And when they saw that species like sauger, drum, and red horse were all completely gone, uh, from the fish markets, they began writing the Fish Commissioner Council as well. So now you have these uh, people in high places as well as uh, movers and shakers in the big East Coast cities wanting these fish for their uh, European cultural wedding traditions and things like that. And so Dr. Spencer Baird had to figure out what he was going to do. So in the early 1880s, he decided that he was going to try out several fish from Europe, and he definitely imported these fish. He flagged these as a fish that he would try out. Uh, he said that, you know, he could try the regular carp, and that was fine, uh, but he had heard of this special carp that, that the people who had been writing him letters had been begging for. So he said, why not bring those over? We'll spend a little bit of money, they have a ton of eggs, and uh, we'll just... Uh, We'll just raise them. So they, they appointed a commission uh, to figure out what America should do about the fish pop problem of not having enough food for the new American settlers. And the game was gone. Uh, there, people were packing in too tight to have sustainable farms with the uh, technology at the time. And uh, they had to increasingly come up with new sources of things like crop rotation and new sources of crops from the Orient or modern-day Asia and things like this to supplement what existed 
indigenously in North America as well as just in European society. So at this same time, they started studying these carp. This commission started studying these carp as a cash crop, and they figured that these could rival grain pound for pound. And in protein, they were even better than grain. So in an 1874 report, Baird wrote that the common carp would thrive better than most native fish because it fed on mostly vegetative matter. While that was partially correct, like trout and carp eat mostly insect larvae, uh, such a revelation was enough to encourage more research. So two years later, uh, Bard, or Baird in, in 1876 decides he's going to bring these over. Now, as he's doing this, the commission reconvenes and says, hey, you know what the best thing would be for fish around America? Stop cutting all the trees down next to the water. So as early as the 1870s, the mid-1870s, they said stop stop dredging the fisheries, stop putting nets across entire rivers, and stop cutting down all the trees, stop putting human sewage into the water. Uh, none of that is good. Don't let cows graze into the streams and things like that. None of that is good. But this was not a popular decision at the time. And uh, at the time, Grant was president, uh, coming off his success in the Civil War. And so they decided to import the carp, and they sourced them from Germany. And they decided, well, if we're going to uh, import these beautiful little carp, Let's get the best ones we can find. So they imported 345 mirror carp and leather carp, which are missing those scales. Now, meantime, in the rest of America, there were entrepreneurs that were selling normal uh, European carp and that were starting to breed them in ponds. So both started spreading. Uh, but these leather carp and mirror carp that were imported were put into ponds in Baltimore at the time, where they were raised by Maryland's fish commissioner, T.B. Ferguson. The next year, some of these fish were transferred to ponds near the capital of Washington, D.C., and they soon had over 6,000 baby carp ready to go in fingerling size, and they shipped out uh, shipments in barrels of these fish and in watering cans or German fish cans which the fledgling aquarium uh, hobby had come up with in the state of Ohio and they shipped off to 273 applicants including 24 state fishery departments these fish the first 6,000 that was enough that they didn't need to send fish back to any of the people who requested them the first year. And by the second year, they had hundreds of thousands of these fish in Maryland and in D.C. and in other states, and uh, they began to travel. Now, also during this time, Asiatic carp began to get out as well and compete for uh, resources. And in these areas where everything had been logged and the water had been completely trashed, uh, the Asiatic carp seemed to have an edge on the European ones. So suddenly you have several kinds of these fish, including catfish, that are available on the fish market. And these fish start to kind of um, go down in price a little bit to the point where average everyday people can afford them. They're not really seen as a delicacy as much because they're taking over these bodies of water where there's no other fish that can keep them in check really. Uh, other than pike and maybe salmonid and things like that in some bodies of water, they really aren't, aren't going to be consumed by other wild fish um, once they have reached larger than uh, a juvenile stage. So, at the same time, you had a man named Julius A. Pape of Sonoma County in California, and he decided that the government was taking too long. He was one of the men writing letters in the 1870s and 80s, and 10 years earlier in 1872, he'd gone to a commercial mirror carp operation in Rhinefield, Germany, and he pur purchased 83 of these beautiful carp. He brought them to California, but only five survived the boat trip that year because he didn't have a steamship. So he took the five six-inch long fish, 
put him in a pond at his house, and he was also into aquariums and ponds and uh, riparian stuff where he would keep uh, all sorts of different uh, little enclosures with fish and birds. And he is actually a man who imported a lot of the subtropical and North American and Central American live bears too for our hobby. But in his pond at his home, uh, he had grown these fish out to 16 inches long. And by the time that he grew them to 16 inches, he counted over 3,000 babies being born to those uh, just over foot long fish. So that means by 1876, he had a thriving fish farm out in California by the time the U.S. government was shipping out both common carp and mirrored carp uh, because they were trying to satisfy demand in all these new towns and cities popping up all over the country. So he said, every fish that I can possibly send to market here it readily sells for one dollar per pound and he claimed in a letter to the minnesota fish commission in 1876 that his fish were far superior to the main fish that the government imported because they would not be inbred with inferior european carp which is not true but uh back then i mean no wikipedia hard to fact check things uh, not that Wikipedia is the best source of info always anyways, but he said there'll be cheap sumptuous food and he began an ad campaign and he began the spread of these carp from the west coast headed towards the Midwest and soon the Midwest was wanting these fish as more settlers from Europe came and they're wanting not the common carp, but they're wanting mirror carp and when asked uh, in 1776 uh, if any of the fish had been put into uh, the rivers of the region, including the Mississippi, um, the Illinois uh, territorial governor said, uh, no, these fish are far too precious to be put into rivers and hatched out for common everyday people. The mirror carp are far superior and they are being kept by wealthy individuals throughout the state. So the carp that did get imported by the government we're kind of sitting in the hands of friends of friends of power and now the government basically was just breeding normal carp and so while the government's breeding normal carp they also start breeding goldfish and that becomes the norm of what people are getting sent to them so this guy in california becomes a whole lot more attractive to buy from and all of a sudden minnesota's governor uh mr hubbard of the time he decided that he should buy uh, some of these Californian mirror carps. So Minnesota still has a good population of these. California does. Oregon, Washington, and a few other states like Texas have big populations. Uh, but the European carp began to take over more and more with every flood season and with more and more settlers and just people including Aquarius returning fish to the waters and they began to hybridize losing their special appearance and their handy uh, trait of not having scales. So these fish have become a rarity in America now. In some places you may say, oh I catch these all the time, but there are many many places where these fish are very rare and unusual to find because of the mixing of those genetics. So if you've seen one of these fish and you know about these fish, you should count yourself as lucky. They're beautiful, they're easy to care for, and uh, don't put them into the local waterways these days. It's, it's far too important to care for our native fish, and we don't need to rely on these for food. But if you do want to rely on them for a cool pet, they can make a large pond pet or friend if you've got a big aquarium set up uh, ready for these guys to grow out to 45 inches or a meter and a half long potentially. Again, uh, more for private lakes and ponds, but nevertheless a fascinating fish and one that fishermen and aquarists should count themselves lucky to see. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you guys enjoyed this deep dive into the history of mirrored carp in America, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe. And if you wanna hear part two, put the little bell on when you subscribe, because in part two, I'm gonna tell you how carp went from this incredible resource and really popular thing in America that everybody wanted to get their hands on, specifically the leatherback carp, leather carp, or the mirrored carp as they're known today, uh, 
how did they fall from grace and become kind of a rarity in the waterways of many states now? So that will be in part two. So subscribe if you want to hear that story. And again, the, the, hitting the like button always helps with visibility for the video. And you can also just share it if you feel like it. If you're feeling really fishy and you really like these deep dives that don't get as much traffic as quick rundown videos, then uh, maybe you could sign up for being one of my supporters and you get four extra audio episodes a week from me on aquatic news and uh, freshwater and saltwater fish news from all over academia and the aquarium world. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!